This week, it's cigarette smuggling, the true harms from vaping, and how do you achieve a 42% smoking cessation success rate? Ain't nothing to it, but to get into it. I'm DJ Alex, and this is your Hunky Vape Global 20 Vape Science Advocacy News for the week ending 19 August 2022. Listen, folks, I'll be the first one to admit that the last episode of the Global 20 was mundane, utter rubbish. That even put my dogs to sleep. So this week, how about I remove the sarcasm filter and give you my unfiltered opinions on the latest science and news. What's the worst that can happen? Last week, we left off with just a brief glance at cigarette smuggling. Hong Kong, $4.65 million worth of illegal cigarettes seized every single day by Hong Kong Customs with $1.03 billion of contraband uncovered this year. And even the village idiot knows for every criminal that's caught there are countless others that are not caught. Subic Bay Freeport, the Bureau of Customs Port of Subic, has seized another container of smuggled cigarettes from Singapore, valued at $46.28 million. Manitoba, Canada, seizes more than 500,000 illegal cigarettes. The Manitoba government seized more than 500,000 contraband cigarettes from multiple Winnipeg stores, which represents nearly $163,000 in potential lost revenue for the province. Regardless of where you live on the planet, the local, state, slash provincial, and federal governments increasingly rely on tobacco sales and all the taxes levied on tobacco products. So what happens when tobacco consumers develop a cheap way to quit smoking and all of a sudden quit paying tobacco taxes? Do you think that the government is just going to be happy about losing all of its tobacco income? Or is it going to become a problem regardless of what the solution is? I mean, if I found out that taking garlic and high doses of vitamin D and vitamin C together resulted in smokers no longer enjoying cigarette smoking, what do you think the governments are going to go do if all of a sudden everybody quits smoking? Do you think that the health departments are all going to be jumping for joy? Or is it possible that the significant loss of revenue would force them to despise this miracle for smoking cessation and start levying taxes on, oh, I don't know, garlic and milk and citrus or who knows what. Think about it for a moment. Penang Customs sees 10.2 million sticks of smuggled cigarettes. Penang Customs Director Dakut Abdul Halim Ramli said acting on information from the public and surveillance carried out by Customs Special Investigations Unit and Penang Customs Enforcement Unit, a container was seized in Port Clan at 1.10 p.m. August 1st. Total value of 7.4 million Malaysian ringgit, including unpaid duty, was confiscated during the raid. Do you think that this criminal gang paid 7.4 million Malaysian ringgits for the 10.2 million cigarettes? Or was it only a fraction of that? I mean, I wouldn't be surprised if this cigarette cartel only lost 7, maybe 10,000 ringgit of inventory. I mean, you got to factor in their profit margin and their markups and the fact that well, they were planning on selling this well below market prices with absolutely no tax collection involved, right? I mean, that's the one thing that's always going to remain consistent throughout history. Sell something that costs, oh, pennies to make 
at a few dollars. It's why tobacco has always been a high profit margin enterprise. And as technology improves, it only keeps getting cheaper to make and more expensive for consumers to buy. Up in smoke, bounty put on head of 1.2 million pound SIG's heist hauler after he double-crossed a Polish gang. A few groups have been contacted, including the real IRA, and offered a hundred thousand pounds in cash to find the driver. Valuable cigarette smuggling is a big money industry. Looking at all these news articles, you would think that we were talking about cocaine or heroin. Some gang member double crosses the supplier and takes off with the cash and the merchandise. So now, well, the gang is looking for the rat and paying other gangs to rat out the rat. Except it's just dry tobacco leaves wrapped in paper alongside a pharmaceutical company made sponge. There is nothing of real value here without government imposed restrictions, taxes, and the artificial value that they create. We all know about the Russian invasion of Ukraine and how this war is affecting countries all across Europe and the rest of the world. Gasoline prices are far higher than they should be right now. In fact, energy costs in Europe for the upcoming winter season are forcing everyone to rebudget their income. Increased energy costs means Everything costs more to buy, including basic things like food, clothing, and shelter. So with all that going on, you would think that the last thing Ukraine would be dealing with is cigarette smugglers. Wrong! The Bukovia cigarette smugglers lost goods worth more than half a million hryvnias. During the implementation of anticipatory information, operatives at the Chernevsky Detachment, together with representatives of patrol police, stopped the illegal movement of excise goods. According to a preliminary estimate, the value of these 15,000 cigarette packs reaches more than half a million hrevnias. Spend a couple hundred, make a couple thousand. Or in war-torn countries, spend a couple hundred and potentially make a couple million. Well, unless it's confiscated. And then you're out a couple hundred and spending the rest of your days in jail. While two new criminals take your place in the supply chain. It's simple drug war economics, folks. When the police take out a local corner drug dealer, two... New criminals pop up on the opposing street corners. It has been that way my entire life. Absolutely nothing has changed. Except the level of violence people are willing to commit. And it's all artificially created and curated by your government. Cigarette prices continue to rise because governments keep raising the excise taxes. And with every tax increase, well... The manufacturer also increases the price to cover the added cost of compliance with the constantly changing government regulations. Here in the United States, it's easier to get a license to sell firearms than it is to get all the licenses needed to sell tobacco products. And it's also less paperwork selling a firearm than it is to sell a harm reduction product. Well, only if you plan to fully comply with all local, state, and federal statutes. And ironically, the required paperwork goes to the exact same federal agency. Now, some of it goes to the ATF, but the rest of it goes to document paying all the massive and tiered sin taxes. U.S. excise taxes on tobacco products are growing at an exponential rate. 
topping not billions, but trillions of dollars. Yet despite what tobacco control would have you believe, tobacco company profits, along with stockholder returns, are skyrocketing just as fast. That's partly because the cost to manufacture tobacco keeps getting cheaper and cheaper. And just looking at the U.S. tobacco statistics from 1935 to 1992, we find that tobacco is the sixth largest cash crop grown in the United States, cultivated in 21 states and producing 23 types of tobacco varieties. The United States is both the largest importer and exporter of this cash crop. The second largest cigarette producer, only surpassed by China tobacco. Meanwhile, the United States leads tobacco exports because U.S. leaf is considered the highest quality and with worldwide cigarette consumption still rising today, capitalist greed is just happy to keep meeting global tobacco demands. You know, like all industrialized and corporatized agriculture, tobacco farms are becoming larger while automation has all but eliminated family-owned farms. Interestingly, farm receipts for tobacco averaged $3,890 per acre in 1992, compared with $200 per acre for corn and soybean. Okay, yeah, I know. You're out there yelling at the TV or your phone going, it's not 1992. Everything's changed since then. What is the price today? If you're not telling me the price today, you're hiding something, right? Surely tobacco isn't that profitable anymore. All right, Mr. Know-it-all. Here is an article written just last year. How profitable was or is tobacco? Tobacco was the most profitable U.S. industry for U.S. stockholders over a 115-year span. But tobacco was also profitable for everyone, from raw material to retail. So how about we just start with tobacco farmers, all right? Tobacco had the second highest profit per acre of any crop in the world. Only a grove of obscure exotic nut was higher. Are you shocked by that? I mean, you're probably thinking, shouldn't poppy seeds or cannabis be much higher per acre than tobacco? Of course not. Those are artificially inflated street prices, just like cigarettes. And since the cartels have monopolized the regions cultivating these illegal crops and the new legal crops, depending on where you live, well, they pay peanuts for the farmers that are growing them. In those illegal regions, even coffee doesn't stand a chance competing for cash. Like all crops, Tobacco yield per acre varies by state and by variety. But looking at this comparison with wheat, you see tobacco yields 2,300 pounds per acre of farmland. And this was from 1980s data. With automation and technology improvements, labor and machine costs are lower now. It's obviously more efficient today than it was back then. Regardless, current price per pound of tobacco is $2.14.4 per pound. Do some math, times 2,300 pounds per acre, reveals in 2021 an acre of tobacco sells for $4,931.20. Meanwhile, the 2021 profit per acre of corn can vary from $275 profit per acre to a loss of $220 per acre of corn. And this falls in line with the long run performance of all industries in the United States. Tobacco on top, while food and everything else is much lower. 
You know, folks, the more tobacco control clamps down on tobacco, the more profit they generate for their arch nemesis. In fact, we're starting to reach the tipping point where criminal organizations can guarantee themselves huge profits from plain, ordinary cigarettes. What's even worse? If and when the FDA chooses to clamp down on illegal vaping products, because they didn't authorize anything, I feel their actions are going to unleash a brand new generation of the mob. Organized crime syndicates eagerly willing to supply the products that millions are using not to burn tobacco anymore. You folks think American jails are disproportionately occupied by black and brown people now? Just wait till the FDA bans menthol. Just like vaping, the raw materials to make it are cheap and readily available. You think menthol smokers are just going to stop using menthol or switch to a nasty tobacco flavor of cigarettes? Of course not. They're going to make their own menthol cigarettes, just like synthetic cannabinoids, also known as spice. Just because it's illegal doesn't mean people will change the way lawmakers intended people to change. Smuggling disposable electronic cigarettes? Anafes is worrying phenomenon. The Confindustria Association of Electronic Smoke Producers denounces the increase in smuggling and spread among minors. Summer 2022 is characterized by a worrying increase in the spread among young people of smuggled disposable electronic cigarettes, illegally marketed through both social media and through some wholesale and retail distribution and resale activities. These are devices that do not comply with current legislation as they often have a tank containing of a volume of liquid greater than two milliliters and with a nicotine concentration greater than the maximum level allowed by law. Set by the EU TPD is 20 milligram per milliliter or a 2% concentration. You think disposable market is bad now? Just wait until the FDA cracks down on illegal disposable products. Their mass denials of all but a few vaping products has already resulted in manufacturers ignoring all regulations and just selling whatever to whomever wants a vape. Regulations be damned. And if you don't believe me, Disposable e-cigarettes dominate the world. The $2 billion U.S. market ignored by the FDA. Fools who submit applications and make a good faith effort to comply with the agency's regulations will receive a marketing denial order and a warning letter. While gray market sellers will change their product names and mock the clumsy regulators. Facts are facts, people. Blue Hole New Consumption Report. August 17th news. According to foreign telecommunications, it's reported that the disposable e-cigarette market in the United States has grown from a mere retail footnote into a $2 billion giant in just three years. Single-use electronic cigarette products, which are mainly made by lesser-known manufacturers, have rapidly dominated the convenience store-slash-gas station segment of the vaping products market. Sales data comes from Chicago market research firm IRI and was reported today by Reuters, which obtained the data through confidential sources. According to Reuters, the IRI report shows that disposable e-cigarettes have grown from less than 2% of the retail market 
to 33% in three years. The FDA mass denial of PMTAs has created an unregulated market. While not surprising to regular observers of e-cigarette trends, new IRI research confirms that the FDA's focus on preventing well-known mass market brands like Juul and Views from selling flavored e-cigarette products at e-cigarette stores and open systems products sold online, simply creating a parallel gray market for lesser known disposable brands. Gray market e-cigarettes are just like black market's products, but they are not sold in underground illegal markets, but are offered at standard retail channels where taxes are levied and age limits are observed. These products are ubiquitous, not only in the United States stores, but all over the world. Even in Australia, where the government has banned all nicotine e-cigarette products without a doctor's prescription, there is still serious fear of teenagers illegally using disposable e-cigarette products that are ever more widely available. What will Australians do with popular products that have already been banned? Probably the same thing the US FDA handles a $2 billion market that continues to ignore the agency's decrees by penalizing companies that try to comply with FDA rules. Fools who submit applications and make good faith effort to comply with the agency's regulations will receive an MDO and a warning letter. While gray market sellers will change their product names and mock the clumsy regulators. Folks, it seems the FDA has lost all credibility and no longer has any hope of actually influencing anything. You want more proof of this? Gummies are the next teen nicotine threat, feds say. The FDA issued a warning to a company selling flavored gummies. Flavored gummies are a new nicotine product in the crosshairs of the Food and Drug Administration, which is continuing its years-long crackdown on nicotine use by teens and young adults. The agency announced today that it issued a warning letter to Crave Nick, which sells gummies containing one milligram of nicotine, each in three flavors, Blue Raz, Cherry Bomb, and Pineapple. The company needs FDA authorization to manufacture or sell this type of product. The agency said in its statement, nicotine gummies are a public health crisis just waiting to happen to our nation's youth, particularly as we head into the new school year, said FDA Commissioner Robert Califf in a statement. What's really sad is Robert Califf and the FDA don't even realize how ridiculous they sound anymore. Walk into a pharmacy, grocery store, and even convenience store, and you can find 25 milligram patches, 15 milligram Nicorette inhalers, 150 milligram bottles of cool berry flavored nicotine quick mist, two milligram nicotine gum. And the FDA says one milligram nicotine gummies are a public health crisis. Seriously? Woolworth, Kohl's, Walmart, and countless other big name retailers all around the globe carry nicotine products. And unless local laws require them to be behind the counter, they are easily found on the bottom shelf in an aisle where any child could easily steal nicotine if they wanted to. What a fantastic way to indoctrinate a whole new generation of criminals. Anyway, I think it's interesting how the FDA can follow the science when a product sum is submitted from a pharmaceutical company. But if anybody else submits a product, well, oh, 
It's a public health crisis. What? You don't understand how nicotine can be widely available and not behind a doctor's prescription, except in Australia? Okay, time for some science. This time, from Dr. Brad Radu's Tobacco Truth website, the tragic story of nicotine misinformation in five images. Similarities of nicotine and caffeine. Brain effects. Both are a stimulant, enhance concentration and performance. Both improve your sense of well-being. Both elevate mood. And both are equally addictive. Hmm, the effects are identical. So let's look at circulatory effects. Hmm. Once again, all the effects are identical. Other effects. Both increase free fatty acids. Both increase catecholamine release. Nicotine increases saliva and lung secretions, while caffeine increases stomach acids and urine flow slash kidney output. The table speaks for itself. As you see, many of the effects are identical to both caffeine and nicotine. But coffee, tea, and cola drinkers are not labeled as social outcasts. There are no caffeine consumption only sections in restaurants, office buildings, and airports. Caffeine users are not condemned to addicts needing pharmaceutical treatment, even though by every measure of drug addiction, both are identical in every single way. Next image from the British Society for Public Health in 2015. Nicotine, no more harmful to health than caffeine. RSPH calls for public confusion over nicotine to be addressed. Next image, FDA refusal to educate Americans about nicotine, factually corrected by Dr. Brad Radu. Nicotine is what keeps people using tobacco products. However, it's the thousands of chemicals contained in tobacco smoke that make smoking so deadly. Some of these chemicals, known to cause lung damage, are also found in some e-cigarette aerosols in minuscule amounts. Next image. Results of FDA's refusal to educate Americans. Only 20% know the truth. Nicotine does not cause cancer. And the last image. 480,000 Americans die every single year because the FDA is misinforming everyone and hiding the truth. So once again, let's go and reveal some of these truths. Vaping, not as harmful as smoking. Vapor Products Association, South Africa, Chief Executive Officer insists. From Pretoria, the Vapor Products Association of South Africa, says the booming sector is plagued by continual misinformation and disinformation, despite scientific evidence demonstrating the vaping is much less harmful than smoking. Chief executive of a VPASA, Asanda Goya, said vaping is the single most effective tool which can move smokers away from deadly addiction to cigarettes. We accept the vaping is not without risk, but it is a potentially less harmful alternative to smoking. What we cannot afford to do is to unduly stymie this technological innovation that can be the single most effective tool to move smokers away from their deadly addiction to cigarettes. We have a collective responsibility to share correct information about vaping and other less harmful alternatives to smoking so that smokers can make an informed decision for their health. She goes on to correct multiple myths, repeatedly confusing the public. However, the one thing that she doesn't cover, which I'm going to address now, is this ridiculous idea of secondhand vape exposure. Now, to be scientifically accurate, yes, 
If you vape indoors, you will leave the surface areas exposed with remnants of your vapor. So, if you choose to not vape indoors, more power to you. However, Public Health England already addressed this myth with scientific detail in their e-cigarettes and evidence update. Just scroll down to page 64 and you can find passive vaping, nicotine from e-cigarette use in ambient air. Four studies examine nicotine exposure from passive vaping, Long et al., 2014. Measured nicotine content of electronic cigarette exhalations and electronic cigarette exhalations contained eight times less nicotine than cigarette exhalations. Just think about that for a moment. If you vape three milligram e-liquid in an open tank setup where you exhale this three milligram vapor, your body is going to absorb some of that nicotine from that liquid. But even the remainder that is exhaled dissipates in less than 10 seconds after it leaves your mouth. And this study states that the exhaled vapor is only one eighth the concentration that you breathed in. That means that a three milligram liquid inhaled results in 375 micrograms per milliliter of liquid that's vaporized. A vapor that dissipates in just a few seconds, resulting in a fraction of that settling onto hard surfaces around the vapor. And this reminds me of an OSHA study. For those of you outside the United States, OSHA stands for Occupational Safety and Health Administration. And this reminds me of an OSHA inspection of an old school vape lounge where it's constantly cloudy inside. They went in and they tested the surfaces. And in most cases, everything that they tested for fell below detectable levels of the instruments that they used. Did you get that? Not only did it fall below occupational safety health requirements, most constituents were so low, including nicotine, that it fell below detectable levels of the instrumentation. Essentially, a cup of instant tea has the same nicotine content as the hard surface furniture of an old school vape lounge. I don't know about you, but my room hardly ever looks like a cloudy old school vape shop. Anyway, let us continue with Public Health England evidence. Estimating environmental nicotine exposure, however, has to take into account the fact that side stream smoke, the smoke from the lighted end of a cigarette, which is produced regardless of whether the smoker is puffing or not, accounts for some 85% of passive smoking. And there is no side stream electronic cigarette vapor. A study measuring nicotine residue on surfaces and houses of smokers and vapors reported only negligible levels of vaping, 169 times lower than from smoking. Collard et al. 2015 describes a model for estimating environmental workplace exposure. The model predicts much lower nicotine exposure from vaping than from smoking at levels that are negligible in health terms. Gowinowitz and Lee 2014 found that nicotine from electronic cigarette vapor gets deposited on surfaces but at very low levels. This poses no concerns regarding exposure to bystanders. At the highest concentration recorded, 550 micrograms per meter squared, an infant would need to lick over 30 square meters 
of exposed surface to obtain one milligram of nicotine. Summary, electronic cigarette release negligible levels of nicotine into ambient air with no identifiable health risks to bystanders. So, if you want to avoid the inevitable buildup of vegetable glycerin, oh, I don't know, on your computer or your windows, well, then go chain vape outside. But if you're only concerned about health risks from secondhand vape, it doesn't exist. And you can feel free to vape wherever you are legally allowed to vape. Frankly, I don't see anyone fiending for nicotine so bad that they're going to be willing to lick 30 square meters of exposed surfaces just to get a single milligram of nicotine. If you want a nicotine fix that bad, just go drink a couple liters of instant green or black tea. At 285 nanograms per gram, well, it's going to take you a little while, but at least you won't consume the billions of bacteria covering 30 square meters of your room. So, time for our next bit of vaping science. German study, electronic cigarettes, without combustion, no harm. Consumers of electronic cigarettes, write the scientists, are not distinguishable from non-users of tobacco or nicotine products. Another scientific study, this time from Germany, shows that the use of electronic cigarette compared to flu tobacco smoke drastically reduces exposure to polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons. These substances are created by the combustion of organic materials and represent one of the main dangers of smoking. Since some of them have been classified as certain or probable carcinogens for humans, it is therefore important, write the authors of the clinical study, to assess exposure to polycyclic aromatic hydrocarbons with appropriate methods in consumers of new generation tobacco slash nicotine products intended to replace combustible cigarettes. One of the main sources of non-occupational exposure to these substances. Holy run on sentence, Batman. Anyway, since I always have to read it right from the horse's mouth, let's go look at the actual study results. In conclusion, cigarette smokers were the only group which showed product use dependent exposure to PAHs, whereas users of electronic cigarette, heated tobacco product, nicotine replacement therapy, and other tobacco were not distinguishable from non-users of any tobacco or nicotine product. Next up, nicotine in e-cigarettes does not cause gum disease. An article in the Times raises the controversy, but according to experts, switching to vaping is also a great move for oral health. Since we don't care about Bloomberg-sponsored propaganda or misinformation, how about we just jump straight to the expert advice? Sir, the article Elf Bars and Me, I'm a Vaping Addict, So Will I Get Gum Disease? suggests that the use of e-cigarettes and specifically nicotine leads to gum disease. But this does not represent the scientific evidence. Tobacco smoking is a major cause of oral diseases, including periodontal gum disease. Smoke and not nicotine is responsible for these harms, although this is often gets confused. Indeed, oral nicotine such as gum has been used without concern for decades. Nicotine use does not lead to gum disease. In the case of bleeding gums, it is normal for smokers to get this when they quit. If this happens, those affected should see their dental team for a full examination. Finally, smokers who are thinking about switching to an electronic cigarette should bear in mind that this is a great move for their general and oral health. 
Signed, Richard Holliday, Senior Lecturer and Honorary Consultant in Restorative Dentistry, Specialist in Periodontics, and Professor Eileen McCall, Professor of Health Service Research, Newcastle University. This is exactly what each and every single one of us out there should be doing. If you see misinformation out there, you must in good conscience correct the misinformation with facts. It's these facts and our life experiences which save smokers' lives, just like our next story. The third edition of Ride for Vape. A 700-kilometer bike ride started from Turin in Italy and ended in Strasbourg, aimed to educate about the benefits of vaping. Two professional cyclists held the long tour called Ride for Vape for the third time, with the aim of educating the public and politicians about the reduced risk of electronic cigarettes in comparison to combustible tobacco. Following the two initial purely Italian tours in 2020 and 2021, this year, the tour was extended to other places in Europe. One of the riders, e-cigarette entrepreneur Umberto Roccati, shares how his life changed thanks to switching to vaping. Before I switched to electronic cigarettes, I smoked up to 30 cigarettes a day for 15 years. With this tour, we want to concretely show that by switching to vaping, someone like me can normalize their health, change their lifestyle, and successfully exercise, he said. Roccati is also the president of Italy's e-cigarette association, Anafe, and vice president of Europe's Independent European Vape Alliance and highlights the need for the WHO to rethink its outdated smoking cessation strategy. WHO needs to rethink and recognize the potential of electronic cigarettes to reduce global smoking rates. Especially in poorer countries, we register particularly high smoking rates. Ignoring electronic cigarettes means leaving people to their own devices, he explained. Meanwhile, the Independent European Vape Alliance has recently launched a new campaign aimed at educating smokers about the benefits and potential of vaping products as harm reduction and smoking cessation tools. The group explained that sadly, the number of smokers educated about actual e-cigarette facts remains relatively low, making it unlikely for them to switch to the products and leaving them at a higher risk for smoking-related diseases. Tobacco consumption is the single largest avoidable health risk and the most significant cause of premature death in the EU, responsible for nearly 700,000 deaths every year. Around 50% of smokers die prematurely, highlights the European Commission. And these lives could all be saved if smokers simply were educated with the truth and given a starter kit to begin their smoking cessation journey. Free electronic cigarette vouchers help two in five smokers to quit in pilot study. More than two out of every five smokers who redeemed a voucher for a free electronic cigarette starter kit had stopped smoking within a month as part of a pilot scheme designed to help people quit. Hey, we talked about this in the news when the study first started. Smokers in Norfolk who had failed in past attempts to quit were referred to a specialist stop smoking service and offered a 25 pound voucher, which could be exchanged for a vaping starter pack as part of the trial. The scheme initially targeted in Great Yarmouth saw patients referred in by either their GP, self-referral, or via other health service. People were given advice and support and were required to cover the ongoing costs of using electronic cigarettes themselves. In total, 668 participants were referred to the scheme between December 2019 and July 2021, and 340 of them redeemed a voucher for a vape starter kit. Of the 340 who redeemed a voucher, 
143 participants, or 42%, had quit smoking by four weeks. The scheme, funded by Norfolk County Council, has been rolled out across the county, and the research team hope it could be rolled out nationally to help more smokers quit. That is fantastic news! The study was so successful at getting smokers to stop. It's now being rolled out across the country. Unfortunately, we know that's going to take a lot of time. Time that these smokers don't have. Anyway, lead researcher, Professor Caitlin Notley from the University of East Anglia's Norwich Medical School said research shows that vaping is an effective way to quit smoking compared to nicotine replacement therapies like patches and gum. E-cigarettes or vapes are now the most popular way of stopping smoking. Our research has previously shown that they may be particularly helpful in helping people to not only quit, but to stay quit for good. We wanted to see whether GPs giving out vape shop vouchers alongside support from the Stop Smoking Service can help smokers quit. We particularly wanted to target vulnerable and disadvantaged smokers who had failed to quit smoking by other means. She continued, this scheme enabled 42% of entrenched smokers who redeemed a voucher to have successfully quit smoking at four weeks. This is especially important because it helped those who have tried and failed to quit smoking many times to move away from tobacco. Overall, the project was well received by smokers as it offered an affordable route into vaping. GP supported the scheme and appreciated being able to offer an alternative to entrenched smokers. The study was commissioned by Norfolk County Council and led by the University of East Anglia, with researchers collaborating with the public health team and the local Stop Smoking Service, Smoke Free Norfolk. Their research titled, A Pilot E-Cigarette Voucher Scheme in a Rural County of the United Kingdom, is published in the Journal of Nicotine and Tobacco Research. That is amazing, a 42% Smoking cessation success rate just for educating smokers and supplying them with a vape starter kit. Imagine if this was done on a planetary scale. The global health gains would be monumentously historical. Okay, okay, I know we're running long today. So one last story for today. Vaporesso gears up for seventh birthday extravaganza. Vaporesso, the renowned vaping brand, is inviting fans and vape shop partners to join them and celebrate the company's seventh year of operations from now until the 8th of September. Throughout the years, Vaporesso has been blessed with the support of fans and partners, said Thalia Chang, CMO of Vaporesso. They continue to value Vaporesso's innovation, reliability, and style. Their unwavering support has made us reach our seventh anniversary. Now, we want to express our gratitude by giving something to all of our loyal partners and friends around the world. Vaporesso has dedicated the previous seven years to creating a smoke-free future while improving the quality of life for its users. Target. The brand's first product was released in 2015, with over 400,000 Target kits sold in the United States. Vaporesso entered Europe in 2016, with Germany as its first stop. Revenger, Vaporesso's first dual battery product, was released in 2017, with over 5 million Revenger kits sold. In 2018, the brand debuted Zero, which set a new shipment record of over 10 million kits. Vaporesso kicked off the PowerShop program in 2019, aimed to open over 7,000 stores globally. 
its Gen series, launched the same year, made high-power devices more accessible than ever before. Following its X-Ross series, launched in 2020, sold more than 3 million kits in 2021. And most recently, Vaporesso redefined direct-to-lung vaping with its newly developed eye tank at the beginning of 2022. 818 Vaporesso Anniversary Celebration. Embrace all love. To join the celebration with your precious memory of Vaporesso, well, you're going to have to follow the link contained in the press release down below. Just upload your precious memory photo along with a brief description about the shared moment. And each participant who submits a photo will receive a Polaroid photo with the 818 Vaporesso exclusive logo. Then, on September 8th, the 18 best participants will be chosen to win the 818 Surprise Gift Box. This contest is sponsored by S'more Labs, 7901 Stonebridge Drive, Suite 208, Pleasant Town, California, 94588. Check out the press release to find concert contest rules and exclusions. Well, that wraps up the Global 20 Vape Science Advocacy News for the week ending August 19th, 2022. I sincerely appreciate all of you who watch this content from beginning to end week on week. Unfortunately, we didn't have enough time to discuss Frenchie's e-liquid, a brand inspired by a vaping couple's pet. But nonetheless, it was a fantastic week full of vaping science, advocacy, and news. I hope you guys have a fantastic week ahead. And my wish is always peace, love, and a hunky vape to end cigarette combustion. Have a great day. Stop.